Hi, I'm uh, Graeme Cowan, and it's really lovely to join everyone today. We've got a great um, attendance. We've got over 350 people registered for today for how to build a mentally healthy culture in the construction industry. And the construction industry, like many other um, industries in Victoria in particular, has had lots and lots of challenges, you know, on the, on the small home sites, there's been restrictions to just five people on site. Um, larger projects have been put on hold. Uh, essential services had to try and keep going uh, as best they could with all the challenges. So it will be a, a multitude of uh, issues and challenges that you've all had. Uh, we were just chatting before we started about how great it is that um, things were opened up between you know, Victoria and, and New South Wales and also Queensland on December the 1st. So it really feels like we are, um, you know, turning a corner, but we can't be too uh, complacent because of what recently happened in South Australia. That's, um, you know, uh, a, a real reminder that we need to stay on our toes. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about quite a few things, but one of the really great parts of this is the capacity for you to ask questions. And uh, we will finish the presentation um, in that half hour by, by uh, 1.30, but we're also happy to stay back and answer other questions. Last week we did it for the manufacturing sector and the questions actually went on for about uh, 20 minutes afterwards. So, um, you know, we're very happy. And we've got uh, two people from um, WorkSafe uh, Victoria who are here to help and, and are very um, familiar with the WorkWell program. We've got uh, Jody Meyer, who's joining us and also Nikita, Mandela. So I will launch the presentation now. So we're going to be talking about, um, you know, what is the Work World Program, in particular the toolkit. There's uh, a lot of very, very good resources there, which we really look forward to sharing with you. Uh, in the space that we've got, we won't be able to talk about all the resources, but we're going to be focusing on the young and, young and new workers. And, uh, you know, there is over 44% of employees in the building industry are under 35. And uh, so this is for the newer people, whether it's new to site or just younger in the years. We're going to be focusing very much on preventing mental health and also the promotion side of it. Um, I've been involved in, in um, training managers for, for over the last five years on how to build more caring and mentally healthy work sites. And I'm absolutely convinced that the most uh, critical thing that we can think about when it comes to mental health in the workplace is prevention and early, early detection. And so we're going to be talking about one aspect of um, of prevention today. We'll also be touching briefly on all the work-related factors, and, and there's quite a few there. Um, but what we also will be emphasizing is the important to, importance to focus and to choose just one or two areas to focus in your organization, which will make a difference. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're also gonna be sharing information from the, the new and young workers. So a little bit about me, um, I'm, I'm really wearing three hats today. I, I did work as a vice president for a global management consulting company. And so I have experience in senior leadership. I have experience also in, in consulting the companies, but I also have my lived experience of, uh, of depression. You know, back, back um, a few years back, there was a real market crash and I crashed as well. And I was literally out of work for five years. And so I know how difficult it is when you are off work with mental distress. I did eventually bounce back and I wrote a series of books in the Back from the Brink um, book series and also was involved in uh, starting Are You OK? with our founder, Gavin Larkin, back in 2009. Uh, and uh, so it's it's... The three hats are, you know, the lived experience, experience in senior leadership, and also um, 
consulting and advising companies on how to build more mentally healthy cultures. Now, just say now, if you have any questions that come up at any time, please type them in the Q&A session, um, the Q&A box, which you'll find uh, there, and we will come to them at the end of the presentation. So why should we focus on building mental health? Well, PwC did research which showed that for every dollar you spend on preventing mental health issues in the construction industry, you get paid back $2.50. So it's a pretty good investment to think about that side of things. Um, mental health claims, as I know firsthand, are much more complex than physical claims and they tend to last much longer. You, know, you can see there that um, after six months, only 54% have returned to work. And after two years, 38% um, still haven't returned to work. So almost one in three, or more than one in three, uh, won't have returned to work. It's also good for business. You know, a positive and work environment drives a positive organisational culture, and it does help reduce staff turnover. I think the most uh, stunning evidence around this is on work done by um, the Gallup organisation. They've been researching employee um, discretionary effort uh, for over 50 years. And they've identified just one question that has the, is most predictive of higher productivity, profit, and, and also customer service. And that's a positive answer to this. My supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person just seems to care at me as a person, really, really counts. And this question has been asked over 30 million times in 135 countries, and they can categorically show that the more people that strongly agree with that statement, you know, the higher the productivity and profit of an organisation. And uh, they're also very, very expensive claims, the mental health claims. You know, as I mentioned, I was off work for five years, a very, very, very expensive claim. I wasn't, um, I was in income protection, not workers comp, but there's obviously lots of parallels. So what's the current environment for mental health in the workplace? Well, Superfriend have just um, released uh, the latest research this year. And there is some good news. You know, um, I think the pandemic has led to greater emphasis on connection. Um, you know, there's been more things like these webinars or team meetings. And overall, this uh, research shows that people do feel a bit connected. Whether or not that's the case in the building is industry, for, particularly for people on site, um, I'm not 100% sure, but overall in Australia, it's more connected. Better work-life balance. You know, many people aren't commuting as much as they used to. And we were talking uh, us panellists just before we started and just said that, you know, many organisations already, and I think it was Westpac just announced it uh, today, are saying that, um, you know, there will, there will be a hybrid work model going forward. People will choose a few days they stay at home and a, a couple of days at work, and I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of other organisations that follow suit. There's been great evidence of leaders stepping up. Like, I've really seen... Um, the demand for, uh, you know, creating more caring and mentally healthy teams increased significantly. And the number of webinars and live presentations I've done has, has more than doubled this year, which is a real indication that, it's, um, that leaders are seeing the importance of it. And there's new initiatives. You know, I've heard of all sorts of creative ways that organisations have tried to build connections, everything from, you know, setting up photography groups or walking groups uh, where people in companies that are interested in those areas, you know, can, you know, share their progress. Movie groups, Netflix groups, there's been lots and lots of creative ways to build the connection, even with when people aren't physically together. But we've still got a long way to go. It still is the biggest cause of lost productivity, mental health claims. Now, that's through absenteeism and presenteeism. And uh, almost half workers reported that it, there's been no real action for them in this mental health, mentally healthy space. And this is particularly pertinent now because the CSIRO recently did studies and identified 
that rising work stress and mental health issues will be one of the top six mega risks for the next 20 years. And that was before the pandemic. That research came out before the pandemic. So it will be a big difference between organisations that succeed and those that fail. And there's real payback, as you can see there, if we do put these things into place, um, you know, reduce the, the likelihood that things happen by more than half, really, really substantial. So what is Workwell? Well, it's a, um, I guess, a, a joint venture between WorkSafe Victoria and the Department of Health and Human Services. And there's really three elements to it. There's the toolkit, which we'll be talking about today. There's learning networks like this, you know, these, these sort of initiatives, which, um, you know, were often live, but aren't anymore. And there was also a mental health improvement fund. So this is funding for innovative uh, approaches to help address mental health issues. You know, a big part of our life is at work. Um, you know, many of us, I think, before this COVID lockdown, often would see our workmates more than we'd see our own family. So it, it is a really important contributor to our satisfactions. Um, there's big benefits in creating positive, supportive and inclusive workplaces. Uh, Workwell aims to take, make mental health a priority, but to really take, as I mentioned before, a prevention-led approach and uh, providing tools for leaders and not just HR and work health safety leaders, but business leaders to implement systems and processes which help prevent issues happening in the first place. And as I said uh, previously, you know, prevention is by far the best way to address this. This is a very interesting um, model in front of you. Um, and just looking on the, on the right of your screen is, is tertiary interventions. And that typically happens after there's been an injury. So, you know, someone's had a psychological injury, uh, you know, then we make contact with them, you know, see if it's a proper claim or not. Um, but by that stage, it's a very, very uh, difficult area to, um, uh, and slow area for recovery. And, you know, as I said, you know, when I was unwell, uh, and I was that way for five years, it just seemed like climbing Mount Everest to get back at work. Now, the next one is, is secondary. And this is uh, information like this, you know, it's putting... It's educating people and training people on how to build their personal resilience, how to structure their work life and everything else. Um, and, uh, and then the, 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 this final one is primary. And uh, so primary is in the prevention space and uh, prevention and primary. So it's about putting things in place so that the right environment exists within teams that lead to a, um, a much healthier workplace. And it is often and very often the leaders and, and, and supervisors that have the major impact on the well-being and engagement of teams. You know, Gallup Research estimates that 70% of the engagement and health of a team is due to what the leader does, what the leader does, says and does. I think we've got a couple of people putting up their hands, but uh, you know we're going to we're going to move through this so that we'll have time for uh, asking any questions uh, as we proceed. So if there's anything that you would like answered at the end, please type it into the Q and A, and we will come to that. So as I mentioned before, there are work-related factors that uh, influence the mental health of an organisation. And this short video just gives a quick overview of that. Work-related factors are anything in the management or design of work that can positively or negatively impact an employee's mental health. When these factors are not controlled or managed, they can lead to stress, which may result in a physical injury, mental injury, or even both at the same time. From workplace relationships to the impacts of remote working, Understanding work-related factors gives you the power to create a positive, supportive and inclusive workplace 
and to develop good systems of work for supporting mental health. Take the first steps today. So how do, what, is, what is the first step? Well, a really good starting place is to uh, tap into and go to the WorkWorld Toolkit. And you can see the URL at the top of your screen, but a simpler way is just typing in WorkWorld Toolkit and you'll come to this page. As you see, you put in information about your business size, uh, the industry you're part of, and you get started. And you get to choose what are the areas that you're particularly interested in. And that helps to really tailor um, the, the courses, the information, the materials that you get to see. So this will just give a, a quick overview of the WorkWell Toolkit. Meet WorkSafe's WorkWell Toolkit, a tailored free online resource helping employers to create mentally healthy workplaces. Sign up and explore your custom dashboard with case studies, videos and other useful resources that you can begin to action straight away with your team. Use a step-by-step -step approach and track each action. Then share the progress with your colleagues. The topics include role clarity, leadership, change management, and so many more. Creating a safe and mentally healthy workplace is good for your employees and your business. Discover the WorkWell Toolkit today. Where, as you can see from that video, there's lots and lots of different categories there, you know, from leadership, change management, but the one we're going to be focusing on today is for new and young workers. And as I mentioned before, 44% of uh, workers in the construction industry are under 35 years of age. And it's structured so that you get this overview. You understand why you do this, what's the benefit. And this, I think, is pretty quite, quite stark. You can see that young, there's quite a few young workers injured in the workplace they are three times more likely to, um, you know, to experience difficulties or injury than those and others. And 42% of young workers were exposed to at least one psychosocial job stressor. Uh, this is a very, very interesting video, which has just been released by Work Well and Work Safe. And it's an actual social experiment and these are real people that are being asked to do things in a job interview. And I'd just like to think you to think of an 18 year old in your life that could be a friend or uh, you know, a son or daughter or a niece or nephew, but someone that you know that that's in that sort of situation. They're very you know, new to the workforce and sometimes they really don't feel comfortable pushing back. Yell and scream a little bit at you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How are you taking that? Like, 
even though came in and they were like taking photos of me while I was working and right. calling me names. Yeah, it's fine. I'll just smile and get over it. But then after, then when you like talk to other people, you're like, oh no, that's not okay. Are you okay with a bit of teasing or name calling? That's absolutely normal to me. Yeah. So when it comes to safety, that's really on you. I mean, at the end of the day, you're not the company's responsibility. Are you? No. Would you be interested in a job like this? I think so. Definitely. Yeah. yeah you will be great. I don't know. I, I want to say yes, but I mean, I don't know. You have the right to be safe at work. Visit the WorkSafe website to see the full social experiment. I think that's just a very stark reminder of, you know, when you're going for your first job or your second job, you often don't have the confidence to be able to push back or even to recognise when there could be bad practices in place. And so the onus, of course, is on the business to do this. So the first thing is to understand the risk factors that, um, you know, people are facing. We're going to be talking through six steps, which are, in the work well toolkit to address this. Understanding your responsibilities is really important that by law, you must provide you know, appropriate safety uh, so that young workers or new workers aren't at risk. And there's some really good um, cards, uh, safety cards in the work well toolkit that provide really you know, quite practical and simple ways to look at how younger workers could be nurtured along. They, you know, use a case here of a, a buddy environment. And I think that's a wonderful way for experienced people to, you know, mentor people and show them how things are done. So step three is to, you know, if you have a lot of young people, just to really ask them about what would be really helpful to them, what training they would value. Um, you know, just to in, engage them in and, and help to own why they want a, uh, a safe workplace, an utterly safe workplace, uh, but also to hear, hear their ideas. And this is uh, a little a document within the Work World Toolkit, which actually tells you how to have that consultation. And then step four is to make a plan on what one you're going to focus on. And, um, you know, as I said, when you log into the website, you can, you know, put in there what you feel, what your gut feel is, is the most important issues. But then we would recommend just, uh, you know, cho choosing something. And so, you know, again, there's these, um, uh, these safety cards which provide ideas on how to provide the supportive environment that young workers are looking for. And then, uh, you know, step five is to select strategies that you will put into place. And it really should be, in my view, um, one strategy. You know, you focus on one strategy, which you think that will have the most impact. If everyone just focuses on that for, you know, 30 to 60 days, uh, you will see progress. It can be very difficult to do multiple things at once. And whenever you're trying to implement change, it is always best to, to, to get one thing straight, uh, to get one issue sorted out. And then, and then the research tells you that the chance you can get a second and a third improved is, is much, much higher. So start small and, uh, and move outwards. They got choose two, I reckon one. <laughs> and monitoring and reviewing, uh, you know, this is having a review session with those people uh, with you, you know, those young people and seeing how it's going, not just the young people, but also their team managers and getting that feedback on the progress of what you try to put into action. And uh, we're going to go to a question soon, but I would, well, in fact, um, very soon, but I'd like to launch a poll to see what have you found most challenging? You know, we've got, um, uh, as I mentioned, we had uh, 350 who were, who were um, registered for this. And I'm just gonna launch a poll now. Now you can choose um, as many answers as, as you like that, are, that you think have been a real challenge for you. 
So I'm just launching that poll now. It should be on your screen. And uh, you can just vote on all the ones that you found to be, you know, a, a, a significant challenge over a period of time. Got quite a few people voting now. Uh, we'll probably give another 10 seconds to just count down. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Excellent. We've got over 70% uh, of the vote there. So we'll end the polling. And uh, this, um, I'll share the results now. And uh, this is consistent with every single um, webinar I've done during the pandemic. The biggest thing has always been the uncertainty. But uh, followed pretty close behind is uh, isolation with 46, uh, not being able to see family and friends, 46, um, the constant change, 43%. So, you know, there's some common elements and even in different um, industries that are run these polls, it has been, um, you know, uncertainty, isolation have always been up at the top. So, and as has not being able to see family and friends, particularly in Melbourne and, um, and Victoria as well. So we just move on to the questions now. And um, so anyone that has uh, a question, um, we'll, we've got uh, Nikita coming back on and Jody from WorkSafe, um, if you wouldn't mind putting on your cameras. And we want to answer as best we can anything that you think might be important. Now, it could be around, um, you know, what happens in a team, what a leader needs to do. It could be about, you know, what happens if someone you think could be struggling. Um, what is something that uh, you would like an answer on? And uh, Jenny, Jenny's uh, here to help curate the uh, questions. And uh, Jenny, uh, over to you. Thanks, Graham. A couple of questions coming through. So firstly, what are the steps to take if you feel like your work conditions or the factors aren't all that great? Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, so first of all, it's about understanding those work-related factors in the, in the workplace further. And the best way to do that is through consultation. So consultation is the most important step to understand what is actually happening in the workplace. Then once you have a clear picture, use the work-related factors. So the 11 work-related factors we talked about previously, um, use those on the toolkit to identify which actions will best support you in managing and improving those work-related factors. And it's also, you know, if the conditions aren't great, you know, the, the positive thing is that it's, if you get them right, you'll get improved productivity, but there's also a legal obligation to have a, a safe workplace, both from a physical and mental perspective. Okay, next question. Christina, what are the, the main benefits of using the toolkits in the construction industry? Um, I could probably answer, the, or, or Graeme, did you want to? Oh, no, I think I, I talked about, you know, the yeah. uh, young, and, young and new workers, but, um, yeah, it'd be good to get your perspective. Yeah, yeah. So as Graeme mentioned in the presentation today, um, research has shown that the $2.50 return for every dollar spent on mental health in the construction industry. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, we consulted with industry representatives in construction and identified resources that would meet the requirements of the construction industry. We have then gone and tailored some specific topics such as work design, alcohol and other drugs, um, managing contractors and subcontractors, and then new and young workers that we talked about today. Okay, excellent. Uh, so next one probably is for you, Graham. So 
uh, how do you encourage young people and disadvantaged people to engage in consultation to make it meaningful? Yeah, it, it is, um, I think, just having a discussion in a very um, non-threatening sort of environment, just saying that, um, you know, you're new to our business. Um, people that are new always see things. You know, I was a, a recruiter for a long time. And when I asked, I'd follow up and ask people after a week, what did you notice? What was good? What was different? Any concerns? People that are new um, often see things that we don't. You know, we've been around an environment or a uh, site for a long time and often we can miss things so yeah asking open-ended questions it could be at lunchtime it could be uh, I know that often including a bit of uh, food can be very good as um, you know part of getting that uh, conversation flowing um, I just sort of add there'd be a lot of, you know we're in the, talking about the construction industry here and a lot of people of course from your industry would be very familiar with Bunnings and uh, Bunnings is quite amazing in terms of the breadth of uh, demographics they have and also, uh, you know, from cultural backgrounds. And it really comes down to, you know, a real focus on listening to everyone. Every single person in Bunnings, all 45,000 workers, are referred to as team members. It doesn't matter whether you're Mike Schneider, the CEO, or, you know, someone who's just, just joined. Everyone is referred to team members. And, you know, they, Mike Snyder also really um, leads from the front and often does interviews. About uh, six weeks ago, he interviewed me about, you know, self-care, crew care, red zone care, and how that could be applied in their, their, their workplace. And so when a leader like that, um, you know, leads from the front and is also, you know, fine with being vulnerable themselves, you know, when we were talking, Mike, you know, explained that uh, Bunnings had expanded to the UK and it hadn't gone nearly as well as they'd hoped. Um, and uh, that was a real difficult time for him. And also said from a personal perspective, had to cancel, you know, his son's 21st birthday because they lived in Melbourne. Um, so, yeah, you know, leaders that, um, you know, are honest, are vulnerable, um, you know, quite inspirational. Uh, you know, people really respond well to that. Great. Um, that's all for the moment. There are a couple more questions, but I know that you're going to answer them as we move a bit forward, Graham. So we'll come back to those. What's that, Jenny? Sorry. There's a couple more questions, but uh, did you want to talk a bit more before we go to more questions? Uh, no, I'm just going to address go to the now. questions. Yeah, good going. Okay. So, um, what tactics have you found most useful in getting more experienced workers to kind of to open up? So just some real, I know we talked a little bit now there, but um, if, for example, if there's a someone who you kind of suspect might be having problems and they just kind of continue to say, oh, I'm all good. How do you really yeah, there's been some them on that? There's, there's been some great progress in the building industry. You know, it, it is often a very male dominated industry but there's been huge progress with, you know, things like mates in construction, where people are encouraged to, you know, be mentors to newer people on a site. And when a manager or a leader opens up and says, well, I don't know all the answers, you know, what do you think, what, what, can you, what could we do? That then gives people permission to make suggestions. And it's also really, really important if someone does make a, a question, or does make a suggestion that you don't say, uh, yeah, that's 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 a terrible idea. You know, you know, say, tell me more. Try to probe. Try to understand where it's getting from, because it, it, even if it isn't a practical idea, if you shut that down, it will dramatically increase um, people's ret reticence to make a suggestion. So when you do ask for ideas and try to tease them out, try to get people talking more. I might just add to that as well, the um, new and young workers action that we um, briefly went through today, that also talks around the buddy program. So it's about really pairing um, those new and young workers or even existing workers up with someone that they build that strong trust um, with that they can confide in. 
Um, it also, there's also, and, and Graeme talked about that there's great initiatives out there. The action also refers to the Blue Hats, um, which is a suicide prevention initiative. Mm -hmm. And that's where there was designated workers or trained mental health workers that wore blue hats. So that if someone felt uncomfortable or, or had an issue, they could then go and speak with one of those members with the blue hat and have those confidential conversations. So yeah, there's some really great initiatives out there now. Great. So um, the question here around the different sort of groups that work in the mental health space, so private groups, government, semi-government, it all seems um, not really cohesive and a bit confusing. So do you think there needs to be a peak coordinating body in this area to ensure a more consistent approach? Yeah, no, it can be, um, you know, really confusing. There are a lot of, there's a lot of resources out there, but there isn't often just one um, place that provides where everything is around Australia. There's been a couple of federal government initiatives which have tried to do that. But, um, you know, I, I do agree that, uh, you know, having a way to help navigate information is really, really important. Now, in the case of what WorkSafe Victoria has done, you know, they've really uh, strived to put that together, but by its very nature and um, responsibilities, it does tend to be Victorian focused. So for people that aren't in Victoria, it, there may be parts that aren't as relevant for them. Uh, it, but it, it does take persistence. And if people have a specific answer or specific question about something you're trying to find, you know, please put that question in now and we'll try to best answer it as we can. But, uh, you know, that, you know, you, you, you have raised a, a legitimate issue for sure. Mm. 